Hello again, everyone. Topic six of unit two is about peculiar instances of nationalism in sport. And in this case, I don't mean peculiar to mean odd. I mean peculiar as in distinctive, unique. Things that are a little different than what we've talked about so far in that they're not so much pre-planned to take advantage of, but things that lead to very interesting and unique sort of outpourings of nationalism that uh, try and rally people together uh, in interesting ways that come from sports, often in the Olympics. But in this case, it doesn't matter if the sport is large or small or the country is large or small. It's uh, an idea that because a moment can be captured and taken advantage of uh, in certain ways, and maybe capture the popular imagination that things are possible that wouldn't otherwise be possible. So peculiar, distinct, unique, uh, but peculiar instances of nationalism in sports. Uh, and so where I want to start is with uh, the indigenous uh, people. Now, the reason I want to start with the indigenous as uh, this peculiar instance is that uh, not always when these uh, events take place are countries ready to receive them in the same way that maybe we wish they should be. For example, one of the acknowledged greatest athletes of all time is Jim Thorpe, whose picture is uh, in, in the middle here, the small one in the middle. Uh, Jim Thorpe was uh, the pentathlon and decathlon champion uh, at Olympics in Sweden. He was a pro baseball player, pro, fo pro football player, pro basketball player. He was uh, someone from the uh, Sock and Fox tribe who could seemingly do anything in athletics. And in fact, there's this uh, famous quote from when he uh, he finished the Olympics when King Gustav V of Sweden said, Sir, you are the greatest athlete in the world, and it would be an honor to shake your hand. And the idea that a king was ready to shake the hands of this Native American athlete is a big deal. And people were proud of Jim Thorpe, but it didn't resonate. And like we said, okay, now we should pay more attention to Native culture, right, or, or, or welcome them into society differently. Same thing when Billy Mills uh, won the 10,000-meter in 1964 um, he, he grew up on a, a reservation, a Sioux reservation, and uh, he, he won uh, this amazing race, but it wasn't sort of a moment where then we, we redefined what we thought of the indigenous or included them differently. Whereas when Kathy Freeman uh, ran in the Sydney Olympics in, in 2000, they were poised, they were ready to take advantage of that sort of statement that Australia had to change the way they looked at, reacted to, engaged with uh, the indigenous and uh, their uh, their uh, indigenous population. So that moment that she was a this great athlete in the face of the games, who who carried the Australian flag in the opening ceremonies. So then, when she won the race, carried both an indigenous flag and the Australian flag to unite them. The people were at a point in history where they could take care of uh, take advantage of that. So it's sort of this peculiar outpouring of nationalism, this unique thing they're ready for that we weren't necessarily ready for earlier. Uh, with uh, our indigenous athletes who won early medals. Um, we have then paid different sort of attention to the indigenous in respectful ways in opening ceremonies. This uh, picture here is from when the five tribes of Utah were involved in the 2002 uh, opening ceremonies for the Olympics. Saw so something similar in the 2010 Vancouver Olympics where the First Nations peoples of Canada were involved. So perhaps it's at a different point in time, but different places can take advantage of things if the time is right. Uh, and it, so it's not always right. Here, um, race and gender is another place where these, these nationalist moments can, can pour out. And the question is whether the society is ready. So here you have on the right a very famous instance that we'll talk about again later in, in class. It happens after Tommy Smith and John Carlos uh, win uh, bronze and gold in the uh, 2000, I'm sorry, 2000, 200 meter dash in the 1968 Mexico City Olympics. And they take advantage of the platform ceremony to uh, to show their affiliation with black pride. Uh, this is something that angers U.S. Olympic officials to no end. It, it empowers several, some people in the United States, alienates other people in the United States, and is one that becomes this amazing symbol uh, because we were at a point in time when we were having conversations about uh, race in different ways in the United States than certainly if they had done that uh, four years or eight years or ten or twelve years, etc. earlier, it would have been uh, difficult. And we can talk also, as we will in, in Unit 3, about Jesse Owens uh, and other American black athletes going to the 1936 Berlin Olympics and sort of showing the, the Nazis what was what. Uh, but those sort of those moments, whether you're ready to take advantage. On the left here is Nawal El Mutawakal, who won the 400-meter hurdles uh, from Morocco in 
1984, a Muslim woman uh, winning a gold medal was a very big deal. She was controversial uh, because she uh, trained in athletic garb, uh, and uh, people weren't sure what to make of that at home. But when she won gold, then it was this very uh, uh, emotional, visceral reaction. She's the first gold medalist from Morocco, first female Muslim to win, uh, and, it, and it's a big deal. But there's not a lot that's sort of taken advantage of after um, she becomes an important figure around the world, but not necessarily in, in Morocco, uh, an important athletic figure, but whether then she inspires people to come on behind her the way some athletes do and, and some don't. So these peculiar instances depend a lot on whether society's ready. And they're more ready when it's more of a general athletic legacy. When someone from the, uh, the sort of the predominant culture, the predominant lineage, uh, of the, of the uh, society, has a great athletic feat, they're more ready to take advantage of it. For example, in 1960, uh, Abebe Bikila won the gold medal in the marathon in Rome, the Roman Olympics in 1960. Now, usually when you hear of him, people don't communicate the full context. It's cool. He wins the first uh, gold medal for a, a, a black African. Uh, Egyptians had won a couple of gold medals in the 1930s. Um, that's neat. It's very important. He ran barefoot. That's neat. That's unique. It's very important. But usually people sort of just explain it to there. He wins from Ethiopia in Italy, running the, the what was then the marquee event, the marathon, through and past all of the great, uh, the, the great statuary and monuments of the Italian culture. Why is that important? Well, Mussolini and the Italian uh, fascists had conquered Ethiopia. Uh, during, uh, before and during World War II, which means that it's only been 15 years by the time he runs in 1960 since uh, Ethiopia has come out from under the thumb of Italy. He's going to win in Italy. He's going to have the Ethiopian flag raised at the gold medal ceremony over some of the great Italian monuments. He even runs past some of the things that Italy had looted from Ethiopia and taken. And it's, it generates a legacy of Ethiopian distance runners that persists. So they're ready to take advantage of it. It's a moment where the society can say, aha, this we can capture, we can move on from this. And it's a very important symbol, a national symbol that is not, not planned. It doesn't, isn't something that the government's trying to take advantage of. When it happens, he generates a legacy. Uh, sort of similar to that would be Kenyan runners coming out of 1968. So the assigned article for this unit is one uh, called Sons of the Wind that looks at the sort of why Kenyans predominate. There's this old joke about uh, how many Kenyans were in the top five of a race or top 10 of a race or top 20 of a race. And the the uh, euphemistic answer is, well, how many Kenyans were in the race? Because if there were three, then there were three in the top five. And if there were five, then there were five in the top five. And it's one of those things we looked at uh, in the unit one with questions of nationality and citizenship with Kenyans uh, um, naturalizing other places to run for other countries. And here in the Palouse, we have a tie to one of those. Uh, a runner named Bernard Legat came to run for WSU in the 1990s, naturalized as an American and, and won a medal for the United States in, in the Olympics and several world championships uh, as an American, which is also one of these Kenyan runners. Well, the legacy comes from Kip Kaino uh, winning, uh, w winning the, uh, um, I think it was the 800 meters uh, in the 1968 Olympics. He's not the first Kenyan to win gold at that Olympics, but it was in a very famous race, a very uh, with a lot of famous runners, and he destroys the field. And it's these these images of, of Kip Kaino and others winning that leads to this legacy that Kenya becomes, right? Kenya at that time is a very young country trying to show what it's capable of, and the Kenyan runners provide that peculiar instance of nationalism. Um, some things are, uh, are are more off the beaten path, right? Uh, um, cross country may not be a, a sport that you watch much of, cross country uh, ski racing that is. To me, it's the most physically demanding of the sports, the, especially the distance cross races, uh, where men and women uh, race uh, uh, in teams of four over uh, great distances. And the Norway and Italy um, raced in three consecutive Olympics, uh, the four by 10 kilometers, so that's uh, 40 kilometers a race. Um, and then in three races, 120 kilometers. The total distance separating the first and second place in Italy and Norway in those times was 0.9 seconds over 120 kilometers. Uh, it's remarkable. And if you add in the other world championships, you sort of have this outpouring of nationalism around uh, distance 
cross-country ski racing. That is not one that you or I would maybe come to expect that that would be a sport that would produce uh, some peculiarities of nationalism, but it does. Uh, then um, you can have things that link from one sport to another. And, you know, this is a sport that's awful fun to watch uh, in the Winter Olympics. I don't know if you watch men's and women's uh, short track speed skating. Um, the only time I ever watch is in the Olympics, so I don't, I, you know, know a lot what's going on in uh, in uh, times in between. Uh, but the South Koreans really value short track. And uh, well, the first time that we ever paid attention to the United States was in the 2002 Olympics, hosted in Salt Lake City, and we had lots of young brash skaters. One of them, Apollo Anton Ono. And there's this move in one of his races where he pulls back as if he's been interfered with, and the judges reviewing the race eliminate, disqualify the South Korean skater, and Apollo Anton Ono wins the gold. And this. Anger is not just speed skaters or speed skating fans in South Korea, but because that matters in their sports space, it angers a lot of people. Uh, I got a, a clip for you to watch in the uh, bonus bits of what happens when South Korea and the United States played a World Cup game later that same year in South Korea. And when the teams tied, they got a late goal to tie the game. How they celebrated the goal goes right back to this moment in this speed skating race. And you have this peculiar nationalist tie where they're so excited to be hosting the World Cup and doing well in the World Cup of soccer, they celebrate based on, uh, on a race in the Olympics in short track speed skating. Very interesting, peculiar instance of nationalism. Now, in, in sort of another example from a, a yet a different angle, you've got times where the peculiar nature of qualification leads to states who may or not always be friendly or enamored with one another, suddenly coming to root for or be interested in or be grateful to uh, countries they otherwise might not be. So there's a couple of examples of when, for example, in 2009, there was a very complicated uh, political um, snafu in Honduras where there had been a coup d'etat. The president had been overthrown, perhaps uh, with U.S. acquiescence or encouragement of the folks that did the overthrowing. There were some tense feelings about the United States in Honduras. Well, in the final game of qualifying for the 2010 World Cup, they needed us to get a victory or a result, a tie or a win against Costa Rica to prevent Costa Rica from going to the World Cup, having Honduras go instead. And when the things broke the right way in the last 30 seconds of a match, when it looked like Honduras wasn't going to go and they did go, then you have people pouring out on the streets. And these pictures show people with Honduran flags, but there were lots of American flags out on the street as people cheered the United States in this very odd circumstance where, uh, where Politically, we were up to some uh, interesting shenanigans in Honduras at the time, uh, and yet they're going to love us. They're going to be excited about us because of what the World Cup and being in the World Cup means. So that sort of collective tie back into these peculiar instances of nationalism. So what does this all mean? Well, it means, like a lot of things, that legacies and national pride are tied to sporting events. Uh, they can come from nations large and small, where sports large and small, right? Short track to be skating is okay. Soccer is okay. Cross country skiing is okay. Uh, we don't know where it's going to arise. And they're not things that are necessarily planned for. A lot of the other stuff we've talked about so far this semester uh, has been more or less planned. Like you're aiming to use sports for that end. You can take advantage of this other sport because of the situations that arise. But in this case, it's more organic and uh, responding. Now, it does require the country to be ready for it. Right, so if you're not ready for it, uh, then uh, then the country can't take advantage of it the same way as with uh, Billy Mills and some others. I know this uh, last slide here says Unit Four, Topic Seven. Uh, sorry, I didn't change that. This was uh, when I was revising the class. This became part of Unit Two, Topic uh, Six. Uh, so pretend that's not there. Uh, I added a bunch of new stuff, but I obviously didn't get all the changes. Um, and then we'll go on to the last uh, piece of Unit Two.